Well, I think the first is you can't think of them as customers, right? Okay. We often think of customers as these machines that eat messages and crowd cash. And instead, <laughs> we should think about customers as people, like real life human beings. And the only way that we really know people is to get really, really close to people, right? And this is this is the paradoxical part here is that you know we have tons of information about people, tons, reams and reams and reams and reams of data. However, um, our ability to extract insights from said data has only increased, you know, marginally. That's because we mistake information for intimacy. So the idea here is that if we start looking at quote unquote consumers as human beings, people, collectives, and we get really close, understanding the things that make them tick, understand understanding the emotional and social job as well as the functional job that they're trying to get done, then we increase our chances of getting those people to move. Welcome to How I Made It in Marketing from Marketing Sherpa. We scour pitches from hundreds of creative leaders and uncover specific examples. Not just trending ideas or buzzword-laden schmaltz. Real-world examples to help you transform yourself as a marketer. Now, here's your host, the Senior Director of Content and Marketing at Marketing Sherpa, Daniel Burstein, to tell you about today's guest. We've been thinking long and hard about community lately, working with the MechLab Super Funnel cohorts. I'm sure many of you are as well. It's certainly a popular concept right now. And here's one way I felt that our community is working. When we could step back and not solve a community member's problem. When members were helping each other, collaborating, solving each other's problems, making those valuable connections, that to me, that's a key inflection point. So when I read this lesson in a recent podcast guest application, it really stuck out to me. You don't build community you facilitate community. It's not all about us, right? It's not all about our brand. It's about them. So here to share that story behind that lesson, along with many more lesson-filled stories, is Dr. Marcus Collins, the head of strategy at Wyden and Kennedy, New York. Thank you for joining us, Marcus. Thank you for having me, Daniel. I'm excited to be here. Great. So first, let me just kind of talk about your background. I cherry picked some things off of LinkedIn. Uh, bachelor's in material science engineering from Michigan. I've, I've had a few people with engineering back, backgrounds on, and it's always very interesting. They're very, very smart people. So I look forward to seeing what you can learn from you there. Uh, then you went on to get your MBA from Michigan and your doctorate of business administration from Temple. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Uh, you are iTunes partner marketing manager at Apple Computer. You've been a chief consumer connections officer at Donner. You've been a jury at the Effie Awards and at Cons. And you've been an instructor at Miami Ad School, NYU, Harvard Extension School, and you are currently a full-time clinical prof- uh, clinical assistant professor of marketing at Michigan, along with being head of strategy at Wyden and Kennedy in New-, New York. There's a lot there. Um, <laughs> Wyden and Kennedy, here's some information I found about Wyden and Kennedy online. Uh, according to the online publication campaign, Wyden and Kennedy had $413.5 million in 2021 revenue. And Marcus himself, as head of strategy, he manages a strategy department in New York, and that is a team of 70 people. So there's a lot there. But before we dive into your background, see what we can learn from you, give us a sense. What is your day like as both head of strategy at Widen and Kennedy, New York, and as a professor at Michigan? It's pretty awesome, actually. I get to put ideas in the world as a practitioner, as an advertiser, and get to put people in the world as an academic. And truly, that's kind of the, the, the bridge that I play, bridging the academic practitioner gap, thinking about ideas with great, great uh, uh, rigor from an academic side, and then thinking about how do we apply those things to the products and, and, and ideas we put in the world. All right. Sounds like fun. I mean, smart and intense, of course, but also sounds like fun. So uh, <laughs> let's take a look at some of the lessons from the things you made. Uh, here's your first lesson. You said identity is more important than value propositions. How'd you learn this lesson? Well, I had the chance to work with the Brooklyn Nets when they were the New Jersey Nets, moving from New Jersey to to Brooklyn. Um, And at that time, the New Jersey Nets wasn't a great team, truly. They didn't have a lot lot to show for themselves. No shade to New Jersey. But they weren't a great team. And we're moving them over to Brooklyn, which was... Uh, kind of a, it was upsetting to the the the, the borough of Brooklyn. One because Brooklyn doesn't <laughs> really like a lot upsetting of to New Jersey. Wow, yeah, that's no. pretty bad. <laughs> well, I mean, New Yorkers aren't really big fans of imports coming in from New Jersey. Honestly, <laughs> not only that, but they were building an arena in uh, New, in the Atlantic Terminal of, of Brooklyn, which wasn't which was actually going to up upseat a lot of uh, companies and and local companies, businesses, and people who live there. So people weren't really looking for this thing. 
Um, and for us, that became a big challenge. How do you bring a team to a city that doesn't really want it? And we thought to ourselves, well, there's not a really great, there's not a lot of great value propositions at our disposal. So what if we set that aside for a moment, set aside the product just for a moment and let's focus on Brooklyn. Let's focus on the Brooklynites. And what do we know about Brooklynites? They are extremely proud of themselves. Very, very, very proud. So we said, well, great. Well, how might we stoke that Brooklyn pride? And we pulled from uh, a page from Edward Bernays, one of the godfather of propaganda, as it were. And he has this idea that you can unite a people by declaring an enemy of the state. So we focused on that. We said, well, luckily for us, there is an inherent enemy of the state for Brooklyn, and it's called Manhattan. So we (laughs) sparked a rivalry between Brooklynites and Manhattanites. Um, and use the Brooklyn Nets as a badge of identity of saying that I'm from Brooklyn. Yeah, I mean, it's true. I was born in Brooklyn. I moved at one month old. I'm still proud of being born in Brooklyn. I agree with that identity <laughs> thing. And I, I love how you mentioned that too, because like I jumped in, so many, the, the city where the team is moving from is usually upset, not the city where it's moving to. So that's a unique <laughs> challenge. You know, Indianapolis, I'm moving, or Baltimore, where they moved in the middle of the night. Uh, but I want to challenge this for a moment, because it makes sense in the context you're saying it, for absolutely. And I think maybe is that a unique context? Because a lot of, you know, people listening, they're selling more traditional products, B2C, B2B. Um, And so I wonder, maybe shouldn't identity be part of what a value proposition is? And maybe you're saying it's not about features and functions. It's about what it means to the customer. And so I just want to give you a quick example here. Uh, We've got a free digital marketing course. And in session number 18, Flint McLaughlin teaches, when we're talking about value proposition, you are fundamentally answering a first person question posed in the mind of your customers. And that question is, Hmm. if I am your ideal customer, Why should I buy from you rather than any of your competitors? And there's a lot of answers there. But couldn't identity be one of them? I mean, I think the Nets, I think Louis Vuitton wearing that purse, isn't identity part of that value proposition? Sure. But when we think about value propositions, we typically associate it to the product offering, right? If we borrow from Clay Christensen's jobs to be done, we think about the functional job. But when we talk about identity, we're thinking about the social and emotional job. And that's usually not a part of the equation, not a part of the calculus as we start thinking about value propositions. You know, even Theodore Lovett's Marketing Myopia talks about the idea that we focus on benefits as opposed to features. Features are value propositions. Benefits are people uh, propositions, if you will. Like, what do people want? You know, the, 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 the old saying, you know, I don't buy a drill. I don't want a drill. I want a hole in the wall. And the same thing goes right. here. It's that, you know, people didn't want a new team. They weren't looking for that. Um, however, People definitely want to project their identity. They want they want to feel proud, especially if you're a Brooklynite. Yeah, I feel that. So take me through, let's say I'm a B2B marketer. I'm selling that, you know, some boring software products, some infrastructure, some, you know, uh, you know, cement pipes that go in the ground. Take take me that. Like, like where does identity fit in there? Is that the idea of, you know, the famous IBM thing? No one ever got fired for buying IBM. It's it's into your career. Like how do you how do you tap identity into there? Sure. I want to look smart. I want to bring new, if, if I'm, if I'm, you know, in procurement and I'm bringing in new things, either I don't want to rock the boat because that's not, that's not really accepted here. Therefore I'm going to buy IBM and to, to your point, what's tried and true. So I don't look like a fool, but if I want to look like a change maker, I want to look like someone who's ushering in change that I'm more inclined to bring something that people don't know, right? It's really in, from this perspective of identity is how do I want to be seen? Like, how do I want people to see me? Like, I love the saying, it's like, identity isn't, uh, or, or um, it's not about how I think I am or what people think I am. It's what I think people think that I am. And <laughs> playing this idea yes. of identity is is looking at the emotional and social jobs that people are trying to get done. And And I would argue that our identity anchors almost everything that we do because it's our identity that our cultural subscription uh, is, 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 uh, uh, is established. Now, let me ask you one last question of how we find out what identities customers want, right? Because I like this idea. I mean, one thing we talk about in the value proposition, it's finding out who that ideal customer is, right? Your product is not for everyone and you can't really make a strong value proposition or a strong marketing if you try to make it for everyone. It's trying to make it for that ideal customer. But the challenge we face as marketers, the blind spot we have is we're so focused on our own brands. We're so focused on our own products, right? We yeah. focus on them all the time that it's hard to really get in those heads. I'm sure the owner of the Nets at the time was like, this is awesome. <laughs> you know, we're moving a basketball team there, right? right. So how, how do you get in the heads of customers somewhat to help understand where identity plays in? Well, I think the first is you can't think of them as customers. 
right? Okay. We often think of customers as these machines that eat messages and crap cash. <laughs> Instead, we should think about customers as people, like real life human beings. And the only way that we really know people is to get really, really close to people, right? And this is this is the paradoxical part here is that, you know, we have tons of information about people, tons, reams and reams and reams and reams of data. However, uh, our ability to extract insights from said data has only increased you know, marginally. That's because we mistake information for intimacy. So the idea here is that if we start looking at quote unquote consumers as human beings, people, collectives, and we get really close, understanding the things that make them tick, understand understanding the emotional and social job as well as the functional job that are trying to get done, then we increase our chances of getting those people to move. I think that ties well into the next lesson where you say uh, you don't build community, you facilitate community. So how'd you learn that lesson? Yeah. So I had the great pleasure of working uh, with Beyonce Knowles, Beyonce as we know her. Um, and I was running digital strategy for her um, in her I Am Sasha Fierce days. And a part of my job, a part of my remit was about, was for moving her offline fan club online. And this is 2009. So Facebook is a thing. Twitter is really starting to come on its own. And in my mind, this is going to be very, very easy. It's Beyonce after all. How can I get this wrong? Um, so we, the team collectively, you know, we, we made a fan club for her. We built a community for her online uh, through these different platforms, her website, Facebook, Twitter, etc. And it was a party no one showed up to. It was like, what's going on here? <laughs> Beyonce is arguably the biggest artist on the planet at that time. Um, and she still is, to be honest. It's, why isn't this working? And as the team, you know, we start to kind of look across the social web to get a sense of what's happening. There's this community off in the recesses of the internet who call themselves the Beehive. And these were a collective of people who saw the world similar to Beyonce. Beyonce has always believed in uh, encouraging or empowering women's empowerment. And they saw the world similarly to her, and she was sort of a, a consecrated among them. And they called themselves the Beehive. They had their own language. They had their own artifacts, their own behaviors, their own norms. And the team decided, let's just cut bait on this thing that we're building here, and let's just help those people connect. Let's just help those people realize things they want to get done. And that became Beyonce's official fan club. And from there, I learned this isn't about building community. It's about facilitating community. Those communities probably already exist. It's about finding them, understanding the things that matter to them, understanding that what they value, understand their points of friction, and how might we use our resources to help remove said points of friction. Yeah, that was great. I've seen um, you know even more B two B companies and B two C basic companies when they're looking to get online, they they learn from social media listening. So I wonder how you discovered the beehive there because they learn you know they're like, what should we be doing online? Oh, we're looking at these platforms. Oh, people are already they're on Pinterest. They're posting our you know marketing charts or something like that, or they're doing this or that. And so that really part of social media listening, that part of you know when I started in marketing, maybe you're in the same place. It wasn't a two way conversation, right? So I was no, excited. Right. You, you do a print ad in the Wall Street Journal, you're talking to them. Um, so how do you facilitate that two-way conversation? Was it social media listening? Like, how do you discover the beehive? How do you, how do you, you know, bef before you can really tap into them, you got to discover them. Exactly. It's that, um, in the, when we call this methodology in academia, a netnographic, um, study where we're looking at these, these people engage in discourse across social networking platforms. And that's kind of the beauty of it. You can watch them unobtrusively engage in their cultural practices and glean insight from it. In fact, my, my, um, my doctoral work uh, was all netnographic in nature, primarily. I, I looked at Reddit to look at how communities um, engage in, in, in their cultural practices and how brands and branded products spread become socially contagious with, within, within these groups. There's so much you can glean from observing people. And by observing people, we get to get much closer. And the closer we get, the better we understand. And the more we understand, the better we can serve them. And the beehive is just one example of that. I mean, today, I would arguably say that's my Excalibur, leveraging uh, uh, netnographic research to understand how communities tick, what their cultural characteristics are, and how might we as a brand, whether you're McDonald's or Delta, Ford or Nike, how might we contribute to these cultural characteristics to help them do things they really want to get done? Yeah, I mean, that is that is the great, beautiful thing about the internet. I remember, like I said, it started in print advertising. I remember my boss being in the airport 
and seeing we had an ad in the Wall Street Journal, and he actually saw someone interacting with the ad. Obviously, you can't read their mind. And we thought, what a cool experience. You're actually seeing someone interact with the ad, right? And then, you know, fast forward on how I made it marketing earlier, I had the CMO of Mint Mobile, and he told me, Every time they launch a campaign, he personally is on Reddit and he's seeing what people are saying about that campaign. Yeah. It's almost like a superpower. It's very cool. And Reddit um, is amazing because Reddit is a community of communities, right? And, and the best part about it, this is the coolest thing uh, about Reddit for a researcher, is that each one of these subreddits, they have moderators and the moderators are cleaning the data for you. So when oh. people post things that are outside of the cultural characteristics of the community, the moderator removes that post. And if that person continues, they remove the person from the subreddit. So you are looking at the best distillation, the best uh, archive distillation of the cultural practices of a community. For a researcher, good night. Does it get better than that? <laughs> That's awesome. I hadn't really thought about it. It's probably cleaner data than some. There's a lot of garbage out there too, right? You got to shift through the That's garbage. That's right. Um, Here's another lesson. I think it ties into exactly what you're saying now. When people feel seen, they also feel heard. So how'd you learn this lesson? So I had a chance to work with Google in the launch of Pixel 6. Um, and the interesting part about this iteration of the Pixel is they were introducing a new technology they call Real Tone. And Real Tone technology uh, was a camera technology where this camera lens was able to identify melanated skin more than it ever had before. And if you know anything about photography and the Shirley card, this essentially was the way by which cameras were able to pick up different skin complexions. And when it got to darker skin, people of color, it was terrible. I mean, I have pictures of me as a kid where uh, I look as black as night, or in some ways I look completely washed out. The, the technologies of, of photography had not caught up to the technologies of everything else. And photo, the photos just did not express what people really looked like. And you know what we thought was super powerful as we talked about this product and we talked to people, of course, through netnographic means as well as ethnographic means and just our, our um, in, in-field conversations, we just realized that when people feel seen, they feel like they have a voice. And, and what we took for granted in photos is that, yeah, I'm in the photo, but it wasn't really me. And that idea of being seen is just a very empowering uh, experience for people. And we, we put the communication out in the world when we launched the product, and that was the stories we got back. I mean, you talk about people interacting with the ad or interacting with the, with the print ad. I mean, people were telling their stories. It's almost as if you know we were inviting them to be vulnerable because the brand was being vulnerable and saying this is something that we as a, as as um, as an industry have not done well, but we've invested five years into doing this well, and the stories were just so heartfelt and evocative. People saying like, "I feel like Google gets me," and who doesn't want to be gotten? I mean, I think that's an awesome place to be as a marketer too, like truly delivering value to the customer. So I wanted to get your thoughts on you know marketers. Uh, within an organization or even you know working on an agency, getting involved in actual product development. Because when I hear you say this, it uh, reminds me of a conversation I had with Jeff Bradford, who is the president of Dalton Nashville, who's a guest on How I Made It Marketing. One of his lessons was, well-crafted video can shape perceptions by connecting emotionally with your audience. Of course, that's mm -hmm. what we think as advertisers, as marketers. I saw some of those ads. They were great. They obviously, you know, the ad you're talking about for the Google um, Pixel 6, connecting with the audience. But it sounds like what you did went farther. I mean, yes, there was the ads and they connect emotionally, but the product itself actually seems like to connect it with the, with the audience. So, I mean, what's your opinion or do you have any advice on marketers, folks who work at agencies, actually getting involved in product development to bring that value to potential customers? 1,000%. I mean, we're marketers, right? So we're not just marketing communicators. We deal with the product, the price, the place and the promotion you go, you know, go to, to the four P's. Uh, exactly Jerome McCarthy for the four P's, right? So we are responsible for product informing the product with the insights, the understanding, the intimacy of, of, of the audience, of the people. Um, so I would argue that, you know, good marketers, brand managers, you know, they, their job is to inform innovation with the people. And the interesting part about uh, the real tone technology, again, this is a five-year investment on behalf of Google, is that it started with, this is a people problem, not a product problem. It's not a, 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 a this isn't a, a pixel problem. It started with a people problem. And 
I think that that's a powerful thing for marketers that instead of prob- starting with business problems, start with people problems. Because if you move people, people will move business. Yeah, I think that's a great point too to technology companies. I know you've got a background as an engineer, right? And uh, with all due respect to engineers, I was interviewing someone, I forgot who it was now, I wish I could credit it. And he said, you know, technology companies need more English majors and they need more poets because they need a better understanding of people and not just technology. And I think that's very prescient too with the rollout of AI and some of those things. I don't know, I wonder about your thoughts on AI from both the engineering background, the marketing background of, you know, some companies, you know, that is very famous now that Google took a very hesitant approach. They said, hey, we're going to wait until this is just right to roll it out. You know, yes. OpenAI, supported by Microsoft, took the very aggressive approach. They rolled it out, it became a big thing. And then, of course, Bing <laughs> did what Bing <laughs> did and was a little offensive. Um, and so I wonder what your thought, too, on there, where it comes to technology, something like AI, something so, so you know, breaking is, where do you find that balance with putting the people first or the technology first or, or maybe both? Well, it's interesting because I, I feel it both on the marketing side where people say, are AI taking over creative? Like, do we need copywriters now that we have AI? And even on the academic side, it's like, do we even assign papers to students now that we have AI? And that's looking at the world through our lenses, right? Yeah. But if we look on the other side for a student, maybe it's kind of cool not to start with a blank page. A blank page is really daunting, right? It's kind of scary. Even as a copywriter, if I just have some stuff to work with, yeah, I'm not going to use that material, but just some source material to start with. And then I kind of go where I need to go. Like that, that's, that's kind of freeing. And I think you're right. Just as much as engineers need more English majors and more poets, I think that poets in, in, in English majors could benefit from understanding the underlying physics of the world around us, right? Maybe what we don't need is polarity, Maybe we need more of balance, as you mentioned. I like it. I like it. Well, uh, speaking of working together, in the second half of the podcast, we talk about people we worked with, people we collaborated with. That's the great thing about being a marketer. We get to make things. We get to make them with people and learn from those people. So uh, the first lesson you have is if you have an idea and it's logical, but people don't get it, then you're probably onto something, even if people make you feel like you're wrong. You learned this from Steve Stout, who's the CEO and founder of Translation United Masters. So how did you learn this from Steve? So Steve Stout uh, is a a legend in the world of of music and also in the world of advertising. He was a a, a music executive for for years and years, responsible for managing Kid and Play, managing Nas. He ran uh, um, Urban Music um, at at Interscope. He, He... worked under Jimmy Iovine. He is the guy. Steve Stout is the guy. And so the lore has it that he <laughs> launched uh, the soundtrack to Men in Black. Right? You know, the here comes the Men in Black with Will Smith. Um, and as the, the legend has it, the lore goes that they sold 10 million copies or so of of the of the soundtrack. And that's, that's massive in the music industry. It's a diamond, certified diamond. And the folks at Interscope were just... Over themselves with, with the excitement, but then Steve found out that the folks at Ray Ban sold twenty million Ray Bans. Now, now it's seventeen dollars for a CD, one hundred fifty dollars for a Ray Ban. He's like, wait a minute, and why did people buy those Ray Bans? Because Will Smith put them on his face and said, "I make these look cool," and Steve said, "I am in the wrong business," because <laughs> if when brands have proximity to cultural products or cultural creators, cultural producers, people are inclined to buy. People are inclined to move because they become receipts of who they are or who they want to be. And when Stout made this move, people say, you're crazy. Why would you leave the music business? You're at the top of the game. He was a, he was already a multimillionaire. Why would you leave this to go to this other industry? And people said he was crazy. And Stout will repeat this. It was a constant refrain. And I worked really close with him for the four years as a translation. And he would always say, if you have an idea and it's logical, it makes sense, but everyone else thinks you're crazy, everyone thinks you're wrong, then you're probably on to something. Um, and I look at that in my career now, you know, like, why would you, why would you go get a doctorate? Like you, you, you're an executive at an, at a, at an advertising agency. Why would you do that? Well, well, it doesn't make any sense to you, but it makes all the sense in the world to me. And I always felt like I'm onto something and that onto something uh, has been extremely powerful in my career. Well, let me ask how you use that as a manager, as a leader within your own business. So we've talked a lot about obviously work you've done with different brands or different clients, but you manage a team of 70. And so 
How do you mean? Because I would think they all think that too. I, that my idea is logical. It makes sense. You don't want bad ideas going out the door. I was reminded of this. I was interviewed by uh, Catherine Hayes of Wharton on her Sirius XM show, and she was going into some of the newest uh, research into brainstorming and how really it's more of the social dynamic and not really an idea to, and to get the, the best ideas. So, you know, you managing your team of 70, how do you manage them and make sure that, okay, even if they think it's logical or if they think it's right, at the end of the day, the best ideas are going out the door to the client? Plus, you're keeping your team happy. I mean, you got to keep that, both that balance, right? That's right. That's right. Well, for me then, following Stout's, uh, Stout's mantra is that I don't have to evaluate the subjective part. I can evaluate the more objective part, the rationality, the logical steps you took to get there. And I can say, as a strategist, say, well, I don't know if that bridge from A to B is actually as solid as you think. Or maybe you should ter- interrogate this a little bit more because I think that's where you're missing that got you to that, that that outcome. So it's pushing on, does it make sense? Is it rational? Is it logical? As opposed to challenging uh, the idea in and of itself. So, And I work in a creative environment, right? I work in an ad agency here at Wyden um, where creativity is, it's it's part and parcel to everything we do. It's the, the center focus to what we do. Um, so when I work with the strategy department, our job is to create ideas that move our business our, our business forward for our clients, I can provide points of view, I can provide provocation against the rational arguments as opposed to uh, beating up the creative, uh, which is a bit more subjective. I like that. Provocation against the rational arguments. That's interesting. I've not heard that in terms of an advertising agency before. I really like that. Um, here's another lesson we talk about. The most powerful skill you can have is the ability to communicate clearly and evocatively. You learned this from Ed Suinjajar. Ed Suinjajar. Ed Suinjajar. He was my manager when I was at Apple. He's the best. He was a director of iTunes and Apple Music Marketing. And how did you learn this from Ed? So, uh, you know, everyone at Apple, Apple is communication matters, especially in this, the Steve Jobs days. And I remember I started as an intern there before, before I came on um, in, a, in, a, in a larger capacity. And every time I talk, Ed would say, I don't know what, you, what are you saying? I don't know what you mean. And it would be things that are like very, very simple. I'd say, oh, that, uh, that shirt is red. He'd go, what? What do you mean? I don't understand what you're saying. And it, it drove a complex with me. I didn't, I, it's like, is something wrong with me? Am I, I felt like I was being gaslit. But what Ed was teaching me was the power of language, the power of words. And he'd always say to me, be surgical about your words. Be surgical about the words you use. He'd tell me to go on, uh, go on the, the, the Apple website and he'd say, read the copy. Look how short the copy is. Someone was very intentional about the words they used. And at that time, I was fairly early in my career, but as a marketer, I was, I was on the earlier side of my career. I found that to be really powerful as I became a manager, as I became a leader, especially when I got into academia, when I started to, to give more talks, when I started to have to be responsible for the words that I use, uh, being surgical became really important to me. Um, and, and so as I think about myself today, I'm constantly thinking about words. I mean, as an academic, we beat up on words. We interrogate words to, uh, to, to no end because of how important language is. And when we're putting ideas in the world as marketing communicators, words are even that much more in, important. So I'm constantly telling myself, you got to be surgical about your words because the words matter. Look, I'm a writer, so I love that. And uh, I kind of, I wonder like, where you find inspiration for the words. Because I tell you, say for me, I found kind of like we were talking earlier, boy, there's just such a wealth of information online. There's, you know, in like customer reviews, if you look at Google reviews, Yelp reviews, like you talked about Reddit, all these different things. I mean, for B2B, sometimes it's G2 and Trustpilot. And it's not just what they say, sometimes or the sentiment. Sometimes it's specific words they use to describe it. And it's different than the words we would use internally, especially for some complex B2B uh, products. And so I will sometimes lift specific words from review. I get them from review as a way to talk about that thing. And I see you nodding, so maybe you've done something similar. But I wonder, like, what what is your inspiration for getting those words right? Because I love that. I mean, I've thought... A long time about just one specific word in a headliner should it be this or that or what? That's right. What does it evoke or what does it literally mean and all these things? So, so where's your inspiration for getting those right words? Well, it's you're right. It's like phraseology. It's the yeah. combination of words that you hear. You go, "Ooh, that's nice. Ooh, that's good. That's nice." You know. And I, I used to be a songwriter, so when I hear certain words, I go, "Ooh, 
it paints such a nice picture. And I grew up listening to hip hop, so you know I, the the analogy I'd use when I hear when I read a a, a tweet or or a post, and I go, oh man, that's a bar. Like in hip hop, when <laughs> when there's a really good line, we call it a bar. Like, oh, that was a dope bar. Um, so when I hear someone say words or I see it written on page or I see it written online, I go, oh man, that's a bar. Let me hold on to that. It's just really, really, really good language. And I think that that's sort of the power of language is the power of a Rosetta Stone that when we're able to communicate things in a way that to your point are, is evocative, but also clear, people can register the idea quickly and they are more likely to buy in. And ultimately, isn't that what we're trying to do? get people to move, get people to, to buy into an idea such that they feel compelled to move. Well, if we're going to go there, and I'm glad you're going there, if we're going to go there, then I also want to talk about the analogy. And I mean, that's what so many ad campaigns are based on, right? And some places right, I've yeah. seen, I mean, hip hop does almost a better job than, than any art form I've seen in making that analogy from, right, the, 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 to paint the picture you're trying to paint. So That's I wonder right. too, like where you tap into for the analogy for a campaign, right? Because a lot of things, especially when it's a new product, we don't understand it at first. I remember Steve Jobs famously said when with iPod came out, it's like putting these songs in your pocket, right? Taking all these songs, songs in, your, songs back in pocket. your pocket. Yeah. Right. Obviously, it was just a hard drive, you know, in an aluminum case with an interface, blah, blah, blah. But he made it into art, you know, as a hip hop artist might do. So where do That's you right. go? Where, where's your wellspring to find those analogies? When, you know, when you're talking about a product launch, any ad campaign. I mean, that's a bar right there. A thousand <laughs> songs in your pocket. That's a bar. Um, for me, I mean, what? it is hip hop. I mean, I, I literally go to hip hop. And when I, in my decks to clients, in my, uh, my, my decks to my students, I am constantly pulling hip hop references. Just constantly. You know, I, um, when I talk to my students and my clients about the importance of social contagion, that people move because people move like nothing draws a crowd like a crowd right so if you can get people talking it will get other people talking and i would leverage uh the lyric from from jay-z we don't believe you you need more people well i don't we don't believe you you need more people come from the the, the take uh the takeover right so i'm constantly just pulling from hip-hop because to your point they are the best at making these analogies they are the best at finding these similes and they can do it in such a way that it's just so clear and also evocative and the best the best copy does that in fact if i were if i were a creative director i would only look for hip-hop artists as my as my as copywriters my favorite just to drop one real quick one you know if you're talking about personal branding or personal value proposition there's a jay-z lyric i'm not a businessman i'm a business man so let me handle my business that's right <laughs> that's right let's talk about one last lesson here um you said execution without good theory is a practice of luck not strategy and you learn this from a professor john branch he's a clinical associate marketing professor at the Ross school of business university of michigan where you're currently teaching uh so how did you learn this from professor branch so john branch uh he's my best friend, but he was also my professor when I was in the MBA program. He actually introduced me, ushered me into the world of, of academia. And you know, I befriended him as a student professor. Then when I became a practitioner after graduating with my MBA, I engaged him as a peer. We were colleagues, but he on the academic side, me on the practicing side. And I would talk to him about new campaigns that we were doing that I'm so excited about. And every time I'd bring him the strategy that led to the execution, he'd always reference an academic. He'd go, oh, that's George Lowenstein. Or, or, or oh, yeah, yeah, that, that's, that, that's, um, that, that, that's Solomon Ash. And I go, what, what, what are you getting this from? How is he doing this? And he's like, well, everything you're doing is based on some theoretical foundation, even if you don't know it. And what I found is that the more I understood the theoretical foundation, it actually widened uh, the the options, the creative options, right? Um, and the greater my repertoire of theory became, I would say the work got a lot better. I became a better strategist. I just saw different, I saw the world differently. It widened my aperture. And it took John kind of doing that over and over again, saying, how does he do that? It's so fascinating. Um, and I've just found that the better we understand the underlying physics of a thing, the better we can operationalize it. And truly, the better we understand the underlying physics of humanity, the better our opportunity to, to tap into it. And everything around us is governed by theory. 
And I know we say, oh, that works in theory when we're in practice, but everything is based on theory. Theory is the best description that we have of the working world around us. And the better we understand that, the better we can leverage it. So take me into the rumor it happens, so to speak, how, you know, academia, it's got, you know, um, certain definitely positive elements to it, researching and learning and stuff like this. But in certain business boardrooms, it's got a bit of a negative connotation. It's slow, it's archaic, it's not happening. And one thing I've noticed, uh, one thing I've written before about is the overconfidence bias, right? This is Mm -hmm. using academia real quick. You could probably explain it better than I can, but I've (laughs) seen Daniel Kahneman talk about uh, fund managers, stock fund managers, and how they see their results and they become overconfident and when really maybe it's just due to randomness. That's right. So take me into the room where you don't have to mention names, but maybe you know an experienced CMO you're working with, marketing director, they've had success in their career, they get that overconfidence bias. How do you bring that academia, that theory in there to help ground it in something deeper? Yeah, so great, great example. Um, I remember some years ago, um, we were looking at some uh, a campaign that we we're going to run on social, right? Some social uh, activation. I remember the client saying, oh, everyone would love this because it's funny and, and people share things because they're funny. And I go, mm, that's not true. They're like, what do you mean? Like, I watched this and that was funny. That's why I shared it. It's like, well, no, 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 no. There are tons of things that are funny that I would never share. I mean, I love toilet humor, like Chris Rock, <laughs> Dave Chappelle, Sarah Silverman, South Park, Family Guy. I mean, I grew up on Eddie Murphy. What are you going to do, right? Like the, 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 the raunchier, the better as far as I'm concerned. But I would never share that on Facebook because my mama's on Facebook. And I would <laughs> never share that on LinkedIn because my colleagues are on LinkedIn, Right. So I'm not sharing them because of their humor. I share them for other things. And there's actually quite a wealth of literature on why we share. So instead of setting a, instead of relying on bad theory, because the theory is if it's funny, people share it. Let's set aside bad theory. And let's look at causality based theory where people share why to gain social currency, which is why I wouldn't share family guy stuff on on Facebook. People share to evoke emotion. People share uh, um, as a way to uh, to provide practical value. Value. People share stories, not facts. Oh, well, with that sort of arsenal of theory, we can now start to inform the work that we put in the world that's based on why people do what they do as opposed to why we think people do what they do. Well, and then that example, and I mean, tell me what you think about this. I think the real, the real underlying theory isn't people share because they're funny, which that's part of it. The real underlying theory is the people I'm trying to reach are like me, I think. I mean, I've seen this kind of flaw in logic often, right? That like, And we that's have to right. realize that we're not always our customers. And I wonder if like kind of academia could bring that into that understanding of, I mean, sociology and all these things, our anthropology, even business is the study of other people. But we, right. when we talk about overconfidence by us marketers, we think, oh, I would like this. My, my favorite, and you can give me one too if you want, is, is uh, as a writer, working with designers, oh, no one reads long copy. You know, no one reads long copy. And it's like, well, the person who reads long copy is a person who's looking for a refrigerator and the refrigerator broke that morning. Like no one else is going to read a long copy out about a refrigerator. But when your refrigerator broke that morning and your milk's getting warm, then maybe you would. So I wonder what your thoughts are about that too. Like really the underlying theory is more that like pe- other people are like us when really they could be different from us. 1000%. I mean, this, this, is, this is our challenge as, as a discipline with segmentation. You know, we look at people through our own eyes as opposed to looking at the world through their eyes, right? Um, you know, we'll say, uh, this is a great Daniel Kahneman one, you know, uh, uh, Deborah drives a minivan. Do, does she have kids? Do her kids play a sport? Where does Deborah live? You have those answers in your head because of how you perceive Deborah, right? But Deborah might have a minivan because she plays the harp and she needs to move her harp <laughs> around, right? So the, 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 the idea really is that we're just not close enough to, to people. And we think that the world revolves around us as opposed to the world revolves around them. And the better we understand them, the better we'll understand their world and the better we'll be able to get their jobs done, be it functional, emotional, or, or social. Yeah, I love that. It reminds me of a great quote. I've heard it attributed to the Talmud and maybe many other places, but we don't see the world as it is. We see the world as we are. And I think That's that right. is our biggest challenge, not just as marketers, but as humans. <laughs> That's right. One thousand percent. One thousand percent. The way we see the world informs how the way the way the world forms in our eyes. So 
we've talked about so many different things about what it means to be a marketer from that kind of academic theoretical pursuit to, I mean, I love this conversation and that you dropped in both hip hop and Eddie Murphy along with all these academics. I mean, that, I think that that will be a unique podcast for, for that reason. Um, <laughs> but if you had to break it down of all this complexity about what a marketer is, what are the key qualities of an effective marketer? I think uh, we are radically, radically empathetic. I mean, that's what empathy is. It's a self-aware perspective taking, right? And the best marketers are able to deny themselves, to deny their biases, to deny um, uh, their ego, and set aside their lenses to pick up the lenses of someone else and see the world through their eyes and understand how they make meaning. Because, you know, to your, to your point, uh, the world is 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 subjective, right? Things aren't the way they are. They are the way that we are. And if we understand how people are, then we'll understand their worlds. And that the best marketers can do this, can be empathetic, which is why. And to go back to, to, to Eddie Murphy, the best marketers are really comedians because they do this very well. They look at people and go, that was odd. That was weird. Okay. Something's happening here. And they apply theory to a social phenomenon. And they're able to make meaning through the eyes of these people. You know, I, I love that you say that. As you mentioned, kind of hip hop has been big inspiration for you. I think as marketers, I mean, we are essentially creators. I think that that word creator has been, I don't, I don't even like to use it anymore. It's been just like taken up by everybody just trying to make a dime on, on social media. But I try to look at other people in the world who create. And for me, stand up comedians. I mean, they are people I try to learn, not just listen to their humor, but learn about their process. Because when you think about what they are trying to do, like you said, they're observing people that are sometimes different from them in the world. They're trying to deconstruct yes, and figure it out. And they are ultimately direct marketers. They are conversion focused. They need to get a laugh. And you know if they succeeded or if they failed. So That's I love right. you bringing up, bringing up stand up comedians in that. That's right. Um, but thanks so much for your time, Marcus. This was, was so informative and, and such a fun conversation. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks to everyone for listening. Thank you for joining us for How I Made It in Marketing with Daniel Burstein. Now that you've gotten inspiration for transforming yourself as a marketer, get some ideas for your next marketing campaign from Marketing Sherpa's extensive library of free case studies at marketingsherpa.com. That's marketing, S-H-E-R-P-A.com.